right, so thank you, everyone. Shaking off the, uh, the lunch, uh, narco sleepy, I call it. Um, anyway, so thank you very much. Uh, I guess uh, we're the second panelist. My name is Alfonso. Uh, the, uh, the panel here has already uh, somewhat introduced is uh, to discuss the connectivity beyond uh, the smart city. And the abstract or the general sort of uh, um, um, focus will be on the evolution of next generation connectivity uh, technology and infrastructure and in enabling progress toward a futuristic smart city vision, which will revolutionize urban life. Uh, and that's big, that's a big topic. Uh, and we'll focus on the outlying communities and rural uh, areas uh, that benefit from new technology. According to uh, trading economics, close to one in five Canadians live in rural areas. These rural uh, and northern areas often suffer from low performing networks, high latency, um, high latency and prohibitively expensive access, uh, despite being drivers of economic prosperity in multi-billion dollar industries, such as agriculture, mining, and forestry. For residents of these areas, internet access is a matter of equality and opportunity for all. In an economy-wide digital uh, transformation, residents and businesses located outside of city centers can benefit greatly from high-speed connectivity. This panel will examine the challenges and solutions of extending ultra-speed network connectivity from urban, center, uh, urban centers to the rural and northern areas of Canada. Uh, we'll introduce, uh, I'll uh, introduce the panelists. We have about five, 55 minutes, um, and uh, uh, each of the panelists will uh, have an opportunity to uh, also say a little bit about uh, themselves and their, uh, their companies. So perhaps to uh, a little bit about uh, um, Orion, and then so I'll introduce the, uh, the panelists from, uh, from there. I think I have the, uh, the clicky. All right, so uh, Orion is Ontario's infrastructure for the uh, uh, innovation economy, including rural, remote, and uh, northern communities. Uh, who I am, uh, obviously Alfonso Licata, uh, and uh, I'm in my third year as uh, CEO of, uh, of Orion. Uh, prior to that, um, I was behind the companies that brought to uh, email money transfers, the commercial MLS system, and that real cool, fun sort of thing that's called time shifting, that when you watch Netflix, the ability to go backwards and forwards, uh, which my children love. Um, why, uh, what is Orion? Um, so Orion uh, is a, uh, a not-for-profit uh, organization which was kick-started by the uh, provincial government, the Harris government in 2001. Orion was built and continues to expand our roughly 6,000 kilometers of uh, dark fiber uh, to uh, municipalities, uh, libraries, universities, colleges, schools, and, uh, and hospitals. What does Orion do uh, for Ontario? Uh, we provide the infrastructure and digital tools critical for creating jobs and commercial, uh, commercializing new discoveries and, uh, and technologies. Uh, collaborating in real time to make um, impactful discoveries, linking rural and remote communities, and improving access to education and educational uh, tools. Over the last uh, two years, roughly, Orion has engaged our community uh, across the province, uh, and we uh, recently published a report that focuses on the North, uh, rural, remote, and uh, First Nation communities, and uh, what we can be doing uh, as, uh, as a government, uh, as Orion, as a province, uh, and as partners in, uh, in changing and affecting uh, change in those areas. Um, one of the things, I like this quote, uh, does Orion have the right properties uh, for the future needs of, uh, of the region? And according to uh, uh, Maxime, who uh, is the CEO of uh, Contact North, uh, the answer is yes. Um, we do, and uh, we are continually upgrading and expanding services, strengthening partnerships and alliances, sharing services, seeking new resources uh, are all very key to uh, the Orion uh, future and to the future of uh, broadband in, uh, in, that, uh, in those areas. Here are a few tidbits that uh, we actually, uh, uh, some of which you may already know, but a few tidbits that uh, uh, we came across uh, in, our, uh, in our report, uh, in our journey in actually sort of accessing and creating that report. So 18% uh, of Canadian households, mainly in the north, uh, don't have broadband access. 10% um, um, uh, of households um, don't have the basic, sorry, what does that say? That's a uh, 10% increase in household 
uh, with broadband could accelerate economic growth up to 1.5%. Uh, approximately 30% of Northern Ontario communities don't have access to uh, very rudimentary access to, to internet. And 45% of rural communities pay approximately 45% higher um, than, uh, than their counterparts in urban areas. So at the conclusion of the report, I mean, obviously we're not gonna get into it here, it's on our website, you can get access to it. Um, we come up with some recommendations, four of which uh, are, uh, are here. Uh, one of them is to boost network capacity and resilience. Uh, the other area we focus in on is uh, partnering with our service uh, providers and partners. Uh, the third being securing funding with partners. The problem, and we'll discuss this earlier, uh, uh, or discuss this in, uh, in the panel today, we discussed this uh, uh, last week on a call uh, prepping for this, is that uh, uh, securing funding for, uh, for the partners, securing funding for the initiative. Um, this is a big problem. Uh, and it is a, a problem that we have to come together as a community to see uh, to resolution. And the fourth is a plan for shared technology services. All right, uh, I'm just gonna introduce the panelists and then we'll, uh, we'll get into it uh, from, uh, from there. So to my immediate left is uh, Avidis, uh, who is the CEO of uh, Storm Internet. Uh, next to him is Jacques Latour, then Howard uh, Sloner, and Sean Sparling of, uh, of Nokia. So I'll let uh, uh, just, uh introduce yourself a bit more. Hi folks, I've been uh, in the telecom industry 39 years. I've worked for Northern Tel. How many people from Nortel in here? Raise your hands. Somebody mentioned DPN. I even go back to SL days, so we're way back. Uh, how many people Alcatel or Nokia? I guess they're called Nokia now. One, two. So we've gone through, I guess, two revolutions in industry, the mechanization industry and then the industrial revolution. Does anybody know what the revolution that's going on right now is called? The second industrial revolution, better known as the technology revolution. There's a lot of things that are gonna change in the internet. Uh, you hear a lot of these companies talking about Internet of Things. Uh, we're all trying to decide what the best way to configure networks, build networks, whether they should be distributed, localized, wireless, non-wireless. The only thing I'll tell you is if things continue the way they're growing, um, it's not just rural Canada that's gonna need a different approach, it's all of the world. Some of you know what spectrum is. That's just like land, except land you can make more. With spectrum, you can't really make more spectrum. There's no such thing. So the challenge is, how do you fit all of these technologies, all of these softwares, all of these services into a concise way of delivering it? And the hardest part is the execution. I've been with Storm Internet now for four and a half years. Uh, Storm's been around for 20 years, believe it or not. They started off as a cottage industry. One of the owners had a cottage. He wanted internet at his cottage. He put up some rigged up with duct tape and antennas and stuff like that. And next thing you know, everybody on the lake wanted the same thing. So a storm was born. It's morphed about five times. When it started, it had less than 1,000 subscribers. This year, we broke the 9,000 subscriber mark in rural Ontario, southeastern Ontario. Um, I'll stop here and pass it on. Well, thank you for that, Davidis. Uh, uh, Jacques, do you want to say Hi. a few words? Hi, my name is Jacques Lato. I'm a CTO at Sura. Uh, so we run .ca, the top level domain. Uh, so we have the registry for that. We have the DNS infrastructure. And we're a nonprofit organization. And uh, we do a lot of community work. Uh, in the internet community. And one of the project that we're pushing is to build more uh, internet exchange point across the country. Uh, that's kind of my role at CIRA, trying to, to push that. And lately we've been working on trying to establish or we're trying to bring the internet in the Calouet. Uh, you might have seen blogs around that. So that's an inter interesting uh, project uh, that we're working on. It's full of challenges and we're trying 
to bring more of the internet there without having fixed fiber connection there. So it's all true satellite. So we're trying to innovate and come up with cool solutions that if it works there, it's gonna work for many uh, rural uh, communities. Thank you, Jacques. Howard? Yeah, my name is uh, Howard Sloaner. I'm the, the VP of Regulatory Telecom for Rogers. Uh, among my responsibilities is to assist small carriers who are looking for the spectrum they need to deploy in small and rural remote communities. I help them get what they need to actually build their networks uh, and then be able to offer services to those communities. Another thing that one of my responsibilities is to work within the Rogers organization to assist the business to tap into all these government programs and to work with the government to help develop the policies needed to help broaden and expand the networks across the country. And I think these two responsibilities kind of demonstrate the, or illustrate the microcosm of what we need to do to bridge the digital divide in Canada. You're gonna need participation from both the private sector and the public sector, as well as large companies and small companies, and only working together in a comprehensive, collective manner are we gonna be able to actually provide service to rural Canadians. Thank you, Howard. So, uh, yes, my name is Sean Sparling. I lead our enterprise and public sector business here um, in Canada. I'm one of those guys that was Nortel, Alcatel, Lucent, and now Nokia. So we're not the flip phone company that everybody's used to. It's, we're one of the largest uh, connectivity players um, supplying to the service network companies, supplying service providers, but also mission critical networks uh, to enterprise and public sector. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity here. Just a little trivia. I have a pair of Nokia rubber boots. <laughs> it's true. Did you know it's that Nokia true. started off as a rubber boot company? They did. I still have, uh, I have a pair of those. They're about this high. In any event, uh, um, so getting into the, uh, uh, the actual sort of panel and the questions uh, uh, itself. Um, so I'll start off with uh, the first topic, and that is, uh, what is the state of uh, connectivity outside of uh, urban centers? Um, does anybody want to um, take a stab at that? Uh, um, Avidis, do you want to sort of uh, perhaps share with, uh, you're probably, probably sort of, I mean, we're all thinking about this, but uh, as, as an actual sort of uh, internet provider, I'm sure you see uh, quite a bit of this uh, in uh, It's a very day -to -day. broad topic. So let's start with uh, why people want rural internet. So if you, if you look at what's been happening with the urban centers, it just keeps sprawling out. Uh, the infrastructure created by, we'll call it the big three or four, whichever number you want to put, and that would be Bell, Rogers, TELUS. Um, they've pretty much owned uh, the internet for the last 20 years. And by putting up cell towers, that gives them also a better reach. Small example, I don't know how many of you know, Storm has 240 nodes in a network in southeastern Ontario. 240 of locations with our own towers and our own network. We have a fiber network in an industrial park just outside of that auction out towards Castleman called VARS. So the toughest part to do all of this is to figure out how to fund the network and why people want the network. How many people think you need more than 10 megabits to run all of your household for devices? Five devices or more. How many people think that? Unless you're downloading movies every five minutes, most people use less than 10 megabits per second right now in rural Canada, and in urban Canada, it's 25. So the, what's interesting about that is, once you get to a certain point, how many people pay $45 or more for their internet today? Okay, how many people have more than 10 megabits today? <laughs> so all of you guys are over provisioned for the amount of things you've done in your house. Unless you're a network gamer. Unless you're, ne even a network gamer, unless you're <laughs> playing seven devices at once, it's pretty tough to beat that. So for example, Netflix takes anywhere between four to six, um, same with all the video, uh, Amazon Prime, all of that stuff. The, the, the challenge is when you get to a household budget, how many spend for their internet more than 10% of their budget on internet? How many know what they spend on hydro and electricity? Is it more than 10% of your budget? So it's a commodity just like those things are. And there's a, 
artificial number in everybody's head in rural Canada as well as urban Canada that they don't want to spend a lot of money on the internet. So that causes a problem for providers like myself and the rest of the panelists that have those issues. If you can only make 45 to $55 a month on a subscriber providing a service and it costs you an average of a million to two million to create a network to support that kind of usage, it's very tough to find the economic model. So the first challenge is the economic model. The second challenge is the need. What are they really trying to do? There was a couple of presentations that talked about uh, smart farms, um, SCADA systems, solar farms. Um, how many acres do you think it takes to supply a thousand people with power with a solar farm? 32 acres. So you have to connect a solar farm in this vast array and figure out a way to connect all of those things. And I think one of the uh, startups said, you got to find that equation where everybody's happy of making money or surviving. And that's the disconnect. So, so my biggest beef is that the big three that I mentioned at the beginning get about 40 to 50% of all the funding available by the federal government, the provincial government, and municipal governments. And the rest is left for the smaller guys. So with that equation going on, I don't see how we're going to connect more and more in these rural places. So thanks. I mean, you touched on a couple of things. Um, one of them was, what is the actual need, right, of uh, um, or differences, for one, but what is the actual sort of need, need. and the capacity to, uh, to supply uh, that need? Is it the same as, uh, as major cities? Are we over-provisioning? Um, and so those are very interesting questions that you touched upon. Um, I know that uh, uh, certainly sort of uh, uh, on our pre-call, uh, Howard had a couple of things to sort of share with, uh, with respect to that. I don't know, Howard, do you want to, uh, do you want to elaborate on, uh, on what Roger's view of, uh, of that is? And, uh, Roger's view of over-provisioning? Well, I mean, what is the need from a rural broadband uh, for, um, for broadband in rural communities, right, well, I, to, I to think actually see and, and if Avitas is correct, um, are we actually, um, you know, are we actually providing enough, too much, and, uh, and such? Well, I, I think what we, the target or the aim here is to deliver a level of service that allows people in rural Canada to participate in the digital economy. So do they need to actually have a gigabit per second service like some urban communities have? Um, in order to get some the best advantages of the network of the internet, I, I don't think so. I don't think they need to get that full level of service. So when you look at the cost, you have to balance the cost versus the service they're going to get. If we try to deliver the exact identical level of service you have in the cities to every Canadian across the country, uh, the cost would be prohibitive. So I, I well, think you're right that you should try to actually balance the two issues. What is the level of service that people in rural Canada need to fully participate to get jobs, to get the education, to get the entertainment? Um, at a level of a cost that we as a society can afford to provide. At the same time though, Hydro's managed to deliver the same service across all of Canada to every single household, right? So it's a national right. So there's no more cost for a telecom equipment to do exactly what the Hydro guys have done. In fact, it's a lot cheaper. What? So I guess the question is, why should somebody in the city have more rights than somebody in I, I, I don't think it's a matter of rights. I think the idea is how do you get as many Canadians as possible right. as part of the digital economy? And if you're going to fiber the entire country and it costs $15, $20 billion, but if you do a limited, more limited service that still allows them to participate fully and the cost is $5 billion, I think we as a society have to kind of balance those two things. And I, I think that's what we, we have been struggling with for a long, long time now, is how do you deliver a, a good level of service that lets them participate fully, allows their kids to do their homework, allows them to watch Netflix, allows them to do, get jobs, you know, uh, digitally, you know, across telecommute um, in a cost-effective manner that we society can afford. Well, thank you. That's, uh, uh, that's actually a very, uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, set of views. Uh, let's, uh, let's move along. Um, what, uh, another big topic. Uh, what benefits do you think uh, can be achieved as a result of extending broadband uh, to rural and northern areas of, uh, of Canada? Uh, if there is a digital divide, in, uh, and I believe there actually is between rural, uh, remote, uh, First Nation communities and urban areas. Uh, so if we take that as a given, 
Um, then uh, what are the, uh, the benefits in, uh, in focusing in Anava? I'll ask uh, uh, Jacques that question. Um, so from our point of view, like .ca, we're a content provider. Uh, the goal is for every Canadian to be able to resolve .ca as close as possible without too much latency. And the issue that we see is that uh, for us, when you go in the region, when you go through satellite, it can take up to a second to resolve a domain name. And that's not uh, acceptable for us. So when we started to look into that, uh, we noticed also that a lot of the communities that have slow broadband, uh, not enough bandwidth, uh, they don't have the capacity to download Windows Update. They don't have the, the capacity to keep their phone up to date with secure patches to patch, to do the regular patch update on their phone, on their computer, on the, all the software. So just doing the basic security work that people should do is, consumes a lot of bandwidth. So either there's enough broadband capacity to download everything from the mainland, and that's hard because often there's packet loss and retries, and it's, it's, it's pretty slow. It doesn't work as good as uh, you'd think in the region. And, but the, the option that we're looking at is, well, if we, one thing we could do is figure out how to innovate to put the content in the communities, the rural communities. So having a box which has all the Windows update, the Android update, the, the phone update, uh, some DNS resolution, so it doesn't take a second to resolve a domain name. A website can have, I don't know, 20, 30 queries to be resolved. Sometimes they're sequential. So just bringing the content closer to the user is going to help them if they have less uh, capacity on the broadband. Thank you. Um, so us at Orion, I mean, we believe that, that uh, uh, there should be sort of no, uh, no digital divide. There is, right? But uh, our, uh, our study, if you will, our review um, of, uh, of those areas and the reason why we published the report was there is a recognition of it. And how can we come together as, uh, as a community, uh, whether that's Nokia or Rogers or Sierra or, or yourselves, um, it's, it's a call to action, so to speak. I mean, this is not going to get solved by any one of us or any one of us uh, necessarily in this room, but us as a, uh, as a community. Um, Sean, what's, uh, what's Nokia sort of, uh, how do you view uh, working with, if you will, sort of those, uh, those areas, uh, uh, mostly around sort of northern communities, and, and what is Nokia doing uh, uh, as an area of focus there? Yeah, so, so one of the biggest challenges when you start going north is some of the costs of deployment. Um, so the technology might be the same, but the cost of bringing people and, and the solutions and the tools to the, the table. And so what we're seeing now is a lot of more automation. So what used to be for an LTE network that used to be racks of equipment because of virtualization now and automation, it can become very easy for the small service providers, the local community to start to build their own networks. Um, in a plug-and-play manner with optimization. So it starts to change that what is the true cost of starting to deploy some of these very remote communities, um, yet don't have to have the full capability and breadth to, to run them, yet still have them um, update. So, so I think technology is going to help along the way um, to really start to reduce that cost of deploying um, in that area. Uh, just extending that, sorry. I mean, I know that uh, Nokia is uh, is actively sort of uh, you know looking at uh, creating their own sort of research and, and and et cetera. What what sort of investments are Nokia sort of uh, making in reducing its own sort of uh, uh, cost, looking at other technologies that makes it easier, if you will, for the storms of the world to be able to uh, yep. um, deploy and uh, um, not just deploy, right? Not just the capital yep. cost, but the operating costs, the operating uh, costs. around that. So we started, I guess, to call you fly your own jets, where we started using our 4G and then ultimately 5G in our manufacturing. Um, when you're deploying into a manufacturing or in a rural area, not everybody understands how to, do, to run those networks. So what we've done is taken that and, and combined it into a full plug and play automated solution so that myself right, could deploy an LTE network and then on the back end, have that optimization. So really reducing it so someone on a farm or just like Storm started the guy right. like on his lake to, to be able to automate. So a lot of research in that, that area. Um, and technology's just moved it so it, it is a lot more cost effective. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's a, there's a strong role for, for government to, uh, to play, right? I mean, I think, uh, Howard, you, uh, you, touched upon, uh, you touched upon this. 
Um, certainly there's, a, a, although there may even be a desire for a Rogers and a Bell and a Taliesin and whoever to sort of enter into those regions, um, the ROI isn't, uh, isn't obvious. The, uh, it's not a question necessarily always of technology, uh, but it may not be, um, there may not be an obvious business model uh, that allows for, for a uh, traditional commercial player to enter into those markets. Um, what role do you see uh, for a federal or, or provincial government playing um, to, uh, um, to make that more, more of an accessible uh, thing for them? Well, I think government participation is crucial. Like, as you mentioned, I think a lot of these areas, especially with our low population densities, it, it's going to require some public money to make these things become more effective. I think I'm actually very optimistic right now. I think the governments at all levels have actually been taking a lot of the necessary steps in the last year. Uh, I think you've seen uh, a couple months ago, the federal government, the provinces actually got together and, and had a meeting about rural deployment and connectivity and realized they have to cooperate further because they haven't been doing it so much in the past, along with the CRTC. Um, I also think you saw the Auditor General's report recently. They made a, several recommendations. I think a lot of those recommendations are actually very wise. Uh, and I think the governments are actually already accepting that these are things they're going to have to implement. Uh, I think the government's recent decision to uh, look at the capital cost allowances to incentivize further investment, I think that's going to take some of these business cases, excuse me, business cases that might have been a no-go are now going to become goes. I think these are all initiatives uh, the government has been doing recently that's going to actually help close that digital divide. I think the government also has other roles to do just as a matchmaker. I think there are a lot of communities out there that are ready to help deploy, uh, but they don't know where to go. They don't know who to speak with. And I think the government can play an important role bringing the carriers, whether it's large, whether it's small ones, and bring it to these communities who are ready to go and help actually bring them together and build out a network to these, to these people. Yeah, I'm curious to hear uh, from a smaller, if you will, <laughs> sort of uh, feed on the street provider. Uh, it's a really tough problem. I, th I think I agree with Howard, government's important. However, depends on the level of government. If you look at a city, they just want to do their own little town. If you look at a province, they want to do an area or a region or the whole province. If you look at the federal, they want to do the whole country. The first thing you need is a, a strategy that says, here's what we're going to do in a nation. Then it gets more complicated because whatever strategy you put together today, and Sean talked about power, the SCADA systems haven't been changed for 50 some odd years. And it's a lot more complex when Google believes one direction, Apple believes in another direction on apps, Google doesn't want apps, and then you've got Facebook that goes in a different direction. It, it's hard to come up with a strategy that you can put together. But there's got to be a spending level that at least gets to a minimum. And I think both the feds and the province um, two years ago said they want it to be at a certain rate of speed for lack of a better um, other measure of a 50-10 or a 50-20. It's not realistic to think we could do that in 20 years with the guy on the street, but it's at least a target. But you still have to take all of those three problems, city, province, country, and figure out a way to get them all to the table and not just expand. The other thing is, small guys like me can't be everywhere, so I resell services from Rogers and Bell. So wherever I can, I compete toe-to-toe -to -toe in the urban centers, even in the rural centers, and by providing a couple of unique things like service, which is something that's died in uh, most of North America these days. I don't know how many of you ever call your provider and wait on hold for 25 to 45 minutes. We try to answer the phone in less than 10 minutes. And we try to solve your problem on the phone. So it's a little difficult to say Fed money would do it all or, or provincial money would do it all or municipal. I, I go right back to the economic model, the restrictions you have on what you're trying to do and who you're trying to mimic and what you're trying to solve. And in the case of the big guys like Google, Apple, Facebook, whoever else you want to use, um, they haven't decided on a strategy yet. Google has more data centers than anybody else in the world right now. Why are they doing that? I thought they were just a search engine. Didn't everybody just use Google for searching? Why do you need a data engine for 
a big data center for, uh, for that. And Apple still believes in apps. Advertising revenue, apps. I bet you all of you have at least 10 apps on your phone you don't even use. You've downloaded it, you don't even use it. So those two models are directly opposed to each other. Then you got the automated car or the autonomous vehicle. To do that, you have to hook up all your highways. Where, where is all that data going to go? And how is it going to travel? You need that network. And I then last but not least, you, you've got the connected home. How many people can say, hey, Google, turn off your lights today? One other guy. There's two of us then in the room. <laughs> so that whole concept, you've got industries and side industries that are connecting devices to more of the network. So you've got what you used to have, just the one plug for the power, and you can have a toaster, an oven, or whatever. You've got an average of 50 to 100 devices in your home. You've got 200 sensors in one car today. If anybody's got a BMW 300 series, there's 210 sensors in that car. There's a master board that controls all those sensors, that goes to a network, that goes to a UDI bus, that goes back to the dealership. That, that is complicated stuff. It's not, it's not a, okay, here's some money for you, fix that. You got to figure out the strategy, and it's got to be done nationally, I think. There's also, when you look at government and their policies, there's other policies that have happened around the world with, whether it's Australia's national broadband program or Poland's broadband, that they're doing their wholesale network, um, to Mexico's broadband wireless network, right, which is a wholesale network where you have one network that's built out and where you have multiple different providers providing different applications or services across the top. So you're, you're leveraging a, a build out for multiple different providers of a service. And so those are policies that the, the government has to get their head around to do, do research around. Right, I think Jacques wants to say something, but before you do, I mean, I think we're, we're realizing that uh, um, one, it's not necessarily a technology problem. I'm not entirely sure that it's it's only a funding problem. Certainly, funding would would help, uh, but it sounds like um, there there may be um, um, a larger play for government to play uh, in the facilitation uh, of a strategy, in the facilitation of uh, of collating, if you will, uh, the various regions uh, of the country to come up with a holistic. Um, um, way of broad uh, of connecting um, the various aspects of the country, uh, but uh, I'd like to hear from uh, from from Jacques on uh, on that. So the the key word that we keep hearing is connectivity, connecting, and in my view, there's not a lot of connecting happening in Canada. That's true. The we that's hard to explain. Because you need to understand how the internet works. The internet is a network of networks. They all interconnect together somewhere. And the vast majority of the Canadian interconnection happen in the US. And that, that's something that's not too good for us, which means if you're rural in BC and you're connecting rural in Quebec, you're going to go through the US far. There's the, tons of latency. And that can be, if we, keep, if we bring the tape, if we connect, the networks, the Canadian networks in Canada, it makes the connectivity better. It, it keeps our, A, it keeps our traffic local, but not, not only that, it, it makes it, it reduces the latency, it makes it faster, we can control the quality of our connection. If we go to the US, there's net neutrality is gone. So what can we guarantee that our traffic is uh, safe or not manipulated and whatever? So connecting is the key thing. In the rural region, when you have, uh, like Iqaluit, for example, they, there's five or six different uh, networks that are not together, connected together. So the students, when they submit their homework at the school, they gotta go satellite up, down in the US, back up to the school satellite network. It's not even, there's no local connectivity in the rural, uh, in the, 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 the regional uh, location. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the, the city connected to the government, connected to the ISP, connected to CBC, connected to all the networks so that there's local connectivity. And the more connectivity you bring, the easier it is. That makes the internet, by the way. 
And once you have the internet, then people can innovate and do stuff. It's easy to connect and start a new cloud service. It's easy to do this and start a new service. And that's why we're pushing for more internet exchange point. That's what those are. They're the, the hub of the internet where networks connect together. So connecting is, I think, critical to making all of this work. So connecting and, uh, and access, and I'll share, uh, I'll share a little uh, story, maybe uh, if you've heard me sort of uh, uh, speak before, um, a story that's personal to, uh, to me. Um, and uh, if you will, somewhat of the genesis around uh, Orion's thinking about uh, uh, looking at uh, the north in terms of uh, bringing better access to northern or remote uh, um, First Nation communities. Uh, it was uh, early on in my uh, tenure at, uh, at Orion, and uh, I was uh, speaking at a similar conference uh, like this up, uh, up in uh, Sudbury. And uh, I was on my way back home right after the, uh, the event. And uh, uh, on my drive uh, back to Toronto from, uh, from Sudbury, I had uh, inadvertently or mistakenly wandered on to a, uh, a dirt road, a, a First Nation uh, community. And uh, it, was, uh, it was getting dark, the sun was setting, uh, and off in the distance, uh, I saw a grouping of about 15 or 20 people, individuals. I couldn't tell age or, 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 or anything, but I could see there was a grouping of people. And as I approached them, I noticed that uh, uh, they had their hands up in the air. And uh, they were holding, uh, if you will, uh, smartphones or iPads. And I can tell because they were being backlit, right? So they were, had a, uh, and I was driving and I was sort of had the, uh, had the soundtrack of uh, Deliverance playing in the back of my mind, wondering sort of where I was going. Uh, and when I pull over, I, uh, I ask one of the people, um, I, I could tell that they were sort of, you know, in the age range of 16, 17, uh, uh, 18. I was wondering sort of what they were doing on this dirt road. Uh, in the middle of nowhere, um, on uh, you know, on their on their devices, and uh, and he says to me, the fellow sort of that I approached says to me that uh, we're out here, um, and uh, uh, we're doing our homework. I said I didn't quite understand. He says that they were they had their hands up and they were actually sort of trying to get access to uh, an internet uh, connection. Um, and it was the only place in that First Nation community that they can get any access. And, and as I looked at uh, the audience, I could see there was almost a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, um, a kid that had an iPad, another one that actually had a pen and paper and taking, uh, and taking notes. This is the challenge, right? I mean, that's, that's more fundamental. It's nice to have, you know, sort of two gigabits of that or 10 megabits of that for this game, for that Netflix or whatever it is. But these are fundamental. Right? These kids were trying to do their homework, right? They weren't necessarily surfing the internet for, for this or the other, of which they should have the very, you know, they should have the right to if they wanted to. But these were people that were trying to get access to uh, uh, basic uh, things that we take advantage, certainly sort of in areas like Ottawa and sort of other urban areas. That's the kind of thing that sort of I think we need to be thinking more about, right? Uh, that rising tides rise all ships, right? Uh, that, you know, who's to say that that next sort of uh, uh, Steve Jobs or whoever is is not in that community, right? Uh, wanting to to participate uh, economically or, or academically or whatever it is in uh, in society, and that is well beyond sort of any sort of smart city connection. That is this: how do I even get onto the roadway, right? So that's where things get kind of interesting and challenging at the same time because um, there isn't an obvious ROI, right? For uh, for a large uh, for a large tackle. Uh, for the smaller ones, there isn't necessarily an easy way uh, uh, um, to be able to help them. I and mean, certainly sort of, uh, you know, everybody's trying to do their best or whether that's Nokia or Sierra. It's how do we come together again sort of uh, as, a com as a community, right? These are the, these are, that's the question, right? That's really sort of what more can we, uh, can we, be, uh, can we be doing? Um, I think that's, uh, uh, I mean, we can continue on, but uh, I think we have here about uh, uh, just shy of uh, uh, 10 minutes. And I'd like to uh, um, open it up for, uh, for any questions, if there are uh, any, or, or maybe even before we do that, is there anything sort of that uh, um, any one of the panelists would like to sort of uh, uh, share be, uh, before we open it up for questions? Question. Yeah. Anybody have any, uh, any questions? There's a mic there. There's somebody. Uh, I'm a rural. I'm a rural person, so I really, this really resonates what you're saying. And we know about northern communities and the struggles they have for services. But I wanted to ask you, so 
When you look at value, you're talking about that earlier, the last panel, the value of something you can sell. Oh. And um, we know that these natural resources are in, rural, are in rural communities, and often the tax revenue goes outside, and often the products are shipped abroad for the maximum revenue. But how is it that we couldn't, like you talked about the interconnectivity of provinces, start getting proud of other regions of Canada and being um, consumers, not just of visiting, but of the, you know, of what we all, of our, you know, there's money that is used, our, our tax money that goes into um, making sure that our oceans are not depleted, that making sure the mining is done in a sustainable way. There's so many entities involved in caretaking our natural resources. So when you talk about rural, everyone says, oh, that's remote. No, that's, that's our resources. And so if that's our resources, um, yes, it's a transportation issue, but absolutely, this is the highway that you're building. And I think what I wanted to sort of say is like, is there any way that you can think about a shifting of like tax base so that we can talk about more interconnectivity and accept that um, uh, you know, what's good for one part of Canada is probably going to be good for, for all of us. Yeah. And uh, I, I've come to learn, thank you, and I, I've come to learn that uh, uh, rural and remote uh, really isn't that remote mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you're looking outside of urban areas, right? I mean, I live in the city of Toronto. Um, you know, you get 45 minutes outside of the Toronto, and uh, and it gets and it begins to, to get quite sketchy uh, there. So you don't really have to go that far out uh, to start seeing a degradation um, um, of uh, of access. So it's quite interesting, sort of uh, how uh, how that is. Um, I think there was another question here at this table up here. Um, Mike. Yeah, sorry, um, difficulty. I, I can hear you, but I'm not sure if the rest of the uh, the audience can hear you. I'll speak up. I'm not too loud. <laughs> so I have a question about technology. Um, what technology are you bringing to bear? Uh, it's like a geo satellite. What do you do? Do you know some things that are intertwined to achieve rural broadband connectivity? Because I think we haven't really addressed what you do in terms of networking. And so that's a good question. The question is, uh, yeah. um, just to repeat it, is uh, what are we looking at in terms of, uh, of uh, um, technologies to, uh, if you will, sort of level the playing field beyond, if you will, uh, I guess more traditional uh, um, uh, fiber or, or, uh, or broadband? Um, and I think you had, you had asked more specifically around, uh, um, uh, around satellite and, uh, and the such. Um, it looked like uh, Avidas had uh, so I'm going to go back to what Sean and Howard said a while back. I don't think this is a technology challenge. Even on the satellite site, there's LEOs, MEOs, uh, GEOs. They're all being advanced. They're all higher speeds, uh, better range, better concentration. And if I even look at the, what I'll call the classic technologies like 3G, 4G, 5G, LTE, whatever the next one's going to be called um, after 5G, I don't think it's, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting though, it's not that much scaled in performance, but um, there, there are some physical restrictions re regardless of technology. For example, in uh, rural, trees are our enemies. They're 60 to 70 feet trees. You can't chop them down in Canada. You're not allowed, You're not allowed to trim them. So we started a while back putting base station in trees. You know what happens after three years when you got a base station in a tree? The tree grows, the base station straps fall off, the angle of where you had them pointed to give you service disappears. So there, there, are, there are some challenges for rural. However, there was another question. I, I'll go back to what I said before. If you don't have a national policy, and I'll go back to this thing that not too many people understand, spectrum. If you don't have a strategy for spectrum, for example, in rural Canada, we use non-licensed spectrum because I can't afford to go to Bell Canada, compete with them to buy spectrum. It's impossible. And for him to be right, for us to get connectivity, somehow that logjam has got to break. 
because I would love to use the higher speed technologies to be able to pro provide better range and better penetration. And to Nokia's point, they're building those technologies. We work with these guys to find out what the next gen is. And I, I, don't, I don't see a technical challenge here. I see a limitation of focus and strategy and money. <laughs> well, I a little bit, a little bit. But it's not that difficult to connect a satellite with a terrestrial. I'll give you my competitors. ExploreNet does it all the time. They provide uh, satellite services in remote areas, and where they can't, they provide terrestrial. So it, it's not the linking of the technologies, it's the actual delivering of the technologies on a common platform on a spectrum license that could be affordable. But I think we can all agree that the technology is improving dramatically. I mean, Absolutely. Satellites where they were 10 years ago is not where satellites are going to be 10 years from today. And I think they will provide very cost-effective solutions that will deliver service to a lot of people that today they currently really can't do. I also think that fixed wireless is going to play even a greater role going forward. I think there are several providers out there right now who are using fixed wireless. But I think as you move into 5G, the ability of that fixed wireless, you know, as long as the capacity is there with the backhaul, can deliver a great service without going to the expense of all those expensive last mile wires. So I, I think that the technology is going to play a crucial part in making and providing a solution going forward. So we have a few more uh, minutes left, and uh, there's a question. Hi, uh, my name is Kirby Koster. I'm with Senjen, and uh, I'm going to be uh, helping uh, move solutions out into rural and northern uh, communities as part of my mandate with the company. Um, my question is, uh, I'd like the panelists to give us some idea of, uh, you know, we talked about the, the average user only needing maybe 10 megabits of, of uh, capability. Um, what do you see the impact of smart agriculture playing in the, in the rural community going forward in terms of increasing that demand for bandwidth? So I think you made a statement uh, uh, um, about, uh, about 10 meg. Um, so do, you want to, uh, do you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, we have actually at Storm about 40 to 50 smart farms. It's amazing. I think there was one presentation that talked about uh, fertilizer, pesticides, when to spray, when not to. So there are, um, in southeastern Ontario, about 40 smart farms that are connected up. And the average connect speeds on those are 25 up and 10 down. Uh, I see that increasing as you automate the autonomous vehicle could also be a tractor. It doesn't have to be a car or a Tesla. Mind you, a Tesla, a Tesla tractor, tractor would be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 610 miles an hour going down the field. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think from a, a perspective of speeds, um, I don't think, uh, again, the technology is a limitation. It's the application that that gentleman was talking about. Of, does it make business sense for a farm that's been doing it traditionally a certain way to change the way they do their business? Um, and I think the other lady had asked the question, if if... For example, on a national level, we decide that our crop productivity needs to go up 20, 30% in Canada. Um, those are design networks that you can build special applications and networks for. And I think that would work very, very nicely. The last few seconds here, uh, Jacques, did you, you want to add uh, anything to that? Or does anybody else want to? I was just going to say, um, not every single application out there requires, you know, 100 megabits per second gigabit speed. Some of these industrial applications or farming applications only need like lesser speeds that you know for monitoring, metering, all that kind of all those kind of functions. So I think it's it's interesting what 5G is going to bring is that the network can actually deliver the really high speed uh, performance for those services that require it, say you know digital surgery, digital surgery or remote surgery, uh, while still delivering for farms that may not need that as, at that level of service the ability to deliver um, those kind of functions. All right. So thank you, everyone. And I want to thank the panelists here for, uh, for participating and obviously Senjen for, uh, for hosting. So thank you very much.